So it's a little windy today. Hopefully you guys can hear me all right. But we're here at Ontario Library in Ontario, New York. And there's a mobile museum here. I will go in in a minute and talk to the guy that's running it. So you guys can find out a little history about Ontario, New York and the war. So I asked him if we could come in and do a little bit of videotaping on uh, I guess the uh, prisoners were and stuff so again I'm not sure much about this so let's uh, go in and talk to this guy let's see if I can set up a tripod in there and uh, see if we can tell us a little bit about it Alright, here's the other side of the bus. Before we go inside. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> what he's got set up out here. POW camps. 1943 to 46. Geneva Convention. My name's Patrick Crowell, Irving Kelman. It's uh, nice to meet you. And uh, actually, what's the what's this tour all about in your bus? Uh, well, I represent a uh, museum in St. Paul, Minnesota, called Traces. Uh, and uh, eight years ago, we got a hold of the school bus and we converted it into a museum on wheels. And we've been touring the country ever since. Uh, the first six years of the tour, we were strictly in the Midwest. Uh, but then uh, we, we realized, came to the, well, we, we knew there were 660 prisoner of war camps all over the United States. So we decided to leave the Midwest and travel uh, the country and go to as many towns as uh, possible that had prisoner of war camps. And uh, I've been on tour. The national tour uh, started a year ago in Iowa. Uh, we headed east to uh, 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 Illinois, south to Tennessee, Kentucky, and then west through uh, Missouri, Oklahoma to New Mexico, and then south along the southern sea coast, uh, Gulf Coast to Florida, and then this tour I'm doing the east coast. Started in North Carolina, came north to New Hampshire, uh, upstate New York where we are now, and then uh, we'll head south as the weather gets colder. So you've been quite a bit all the way around then. All over the so, you're not, so you're doing the total, all the prisoner of war? And as many towns as will have us. We uh, charge the ho uh, a fee for uh, to host us, uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, the way the economy is now, there is not too many libraries or uh, schools that can uh, can afford the, the, the fee. But we're, we're trying our best. So, so how does somebody contact you to be able well, to do we, something like this? Well, um, uh, we have a website. It's uh, www.traces t r a c e s traces dot o r g. Okay. Uh, get in contact with us, and uh, we'd be more than happy. Uh, uh, Basically, wherever you are, we can uh, come to you. Yeah, I'm going to stay until you uh, you have all seen the video. I, I will stay here as long as it takes until you all see the video. Thank you. Thank you. And thank the library for having us. So you try to, do you, you just do libraries or do you get to uh, any no, no, places we, like VFWs uh, or something like uh, that? Or? We do go to VFW and American Legion Post. Uh, it's about 80% libraries, 15% uh, schools, and the other 5% are VFW, American Legion Post, and other museums. So you basically are a non-profit organization? Uh, the, 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 the Traces is a non-profit uh, um, uh, museum. Uh, we uh, apply for grants, uh, donations, and then the hosts pay for us to come. Awesome. To learn something of Fort Niagara's past.
Without a detailed understanding of the flow of events in the fort's lifetime, the artist could not do a credible job of depicting the fort's varied history. What Villa needed to know about the Niger frontier had not been learned in Germany. What I knew about American history before I came here was basically as much as any typical German school student at that time would learn. When I arrived at Fort Niagara, of course, I was a prisoner of war. But there are two ways of dealing with imprisonment. You can try to accept your circumstances, or you can try to resist them. For my part, I tried to accept everything as it was. However, to work on the mural, I had to ask for books to gain the information I needed about what I was painting. I wanted the historical facts to be very precise. I was able to find out about all the 17th century historical events that are depicted in the mural. In fact, it was Colonel Bolton who helped me get all those books. He had a brother who was an academic, and the brother helped Colonel Bolton obtain the books I needed. One day, Colonel Bolton's brother came with a very rare book. Only ten copies of it had ever been printed. The book, printed by a wealthy American, was amazing for its excellent quality. Those research books that were given to me were all placed in a box. I left the box with a family from Niagara Falls or Lewiston named Diamond. The box contained all my research and some of my planning sketches. If someone were to locate that box today, they could see how my work developed. All the mysteries about how the mural came to be would be solved. Perhaps someone knows the Diamond family and can help find my books and drawings. I believe they moved to some place in the state of Florida. When I began planning the mural, I recalled that it took Michelangelo four years to paint his ceiling. As it turned out, I only had a year and a half. But when I read the story of Michelangelo and how he suffered during his efforts, I didn't feel so bad. When I was doing my apprenticeship to become a painter, someone gave me a little book about the frescoes of Pompeii. And of course, anyone interested in murals or wall paintings would eventually have to look to Michelangelo. But before Michelangelo, there was an artist named Masaccio. He was of great interest to me because he was a painter. Michelangelo was fundamentally a sculptor who was required to paint. It was Masaccio who had the greatest influence on my work, even here at Fort Niagara. When a painter has an idea, he is excited about getting started right away. And so it was with me. I didn't know how much time I would spend on the mural. I didn't know how long I would be here in America. My idea was to show quite a number of people in the mural. Since there was a lot of work to do, I was allowed to stay here working long hours every day, even until midnight, without any guard or soldier leading me around. It was very easy to get supplies. As a painter, I was experienced in how to make my artwork last. When I examined the wall of the officers' club, I saw that it was made of a variety of materials, brick, and wood, and so on. There's a trick for such situations, which old craftsmen know and which I learn. You place a covering over the existing surface. You can use linen or some other material. In this case, the Army supplied us with Army-issued bed sheets, which we sewed together and glued to the wall. In his choice of pigments, Bert's Villa wanted very much to use the familiar brand of paint made by a German firm, Shemeka. That the war was still armed did not deter the artist. He thought it quite probable that Shemeka's pigments might still be available from pre-war inventories in local art supply stores, but sold under an American brand name. Colonel Bolton assigned a lieutenant to drive Villa from art shop to art shop in western New York in search for the special paints. Ultimately, they were found in a shop in Buffalo. Villa bought the entire supply. The freedom of a relatively open the and culturally diverse American society. Either when they were American music with them in the camps. Okay, these are prisoners that were here, that, that we brought here. That we brought here, that we captured on the battlefield in North, uh, North Africa and Europe. Okay. And during my imprisonment, uh, brought to New York, at first it was my artwork, and then classical music that brought me comfort in my captivity. 
I was just a kid. In some abstract way that I cannot now explain, the music oh, gave me yeah. a sense of freedom. There were 660 prisoners Recently, working I was throughout the U.S. There were 40 of them in, uh, up I mentioned in New York. that George Gershwin's yeah, Rhapsody of all them gave me a feeling of freedom Fly, that Bob I've never Hill, experienced before. Uh, Marion, Medina, in coming to America, uh, I got the opportunity to listen to many different kinds of music. And in doing so, I learned more about the spirit of freedom. All over upstate New York. Yep. Uh, the, as, far, as far as we know, the Traces Museum is uh, the only museum in the entire country that puts itself on wheels and travels the countryside. Um, we try to tell that we're t our, our focus is telling the untold stories of World War II. Uh, very few people realize that there were 660 prisoner of war camps throughout the United States, that we held over 420,000 prisoners. Uh, 380,000 German POWs, a little over 50,000 Italian, and a little over 5,000 Japanese prisoners. Um, no prisoners uh, um, have been treated as well before or since. We treated the prisoners of war well uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the Geneva Convention. We not only wanted to live up to the letter of the, of the convention, but also to the spirit of the convention. Uh, we felt that if w the POWs were treated well, word would get back to Germany, they would treat our prisoners a little bit better, and they did. But also if word would get back to the German army itself, that uh, POWs are the, the German army, if you surrender to the Americans, you won't be harmed, you'll be treated well. Maybe a German soldier will be a little less willing to fight and a little bit more willing to surrender. And every German soldier who laid down his arms was one less American soldier being shot at. Uh, which in the long run would save lives, and uh, that also turned out to be true. So there was a, a, a overview of why we treated the prisoners so well. We brought them to the states for several reasons. One, um, we captured so many that it became a logistical nightmare to try to feed them, clothe them, and house them. At the same time, we needed to feed, clothe, and house our own troops, plus fight the war. And then also they felt that uh, if, if they, there was a, 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 a massive escape attempt, it would wreck uh, a, a havoc in the, in the rear, the, the uh, back lines, of the, the rear of the, of the uh, fighting force. We were sending our troops to Europe on Liberty ships. Why send the ships back empty? Fill them up with prisoners of war. You put an ocean between them and home, they try to escape, they essentially have no place to go. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then once they got here, it was realized uh, we needed their labor. All our men were gone fighting the war, there was a labor shortage, so it was ultimately decided we've got the POWs here, let's put them to work and they can fill that labor gap. And that's how so many camps sprang up. At first there were 110 base camps. Base camps held thousands of men, uh, and then when the work uh, needed to be done, they would set up 550 branch camps, and the branch camps held uh, anywhere from 50 to several hundred men, and that's where the men actually went out to work. Wow. And they built roads, they built bridges, they built dams, uh, they built sewer systems, they built houses, they built barns, they worked in the farm, fa farm fields, they worked in canning factories, uh, they worked in the pulp mills, they worked in forests. Uh, and in fact, uh, I just saw a, a, a report that the uh, Army filled out at the end of the war, $25 million was uh, um, uh, amassed by the, by the POWs uh, uh, from, their, from their labor. And it, it basically saved a lot of crops. Uh, they, they saved uh, uh, the, uh, in the orchards, they, uh, picking uh, apples and fruits, they saved the crop because there was nobody else to, to uh, pick the crop. Uh, they saved the pea crop and the wheat fields in uh, Minnesota and in the Dakotas in both 44 and 45. So their work was ver very much needed. Um, what would they get out of it in return? Well, they were made 10 cents an hour. Oh, they were uh, They were paid 10 cents an hour up to 80 cents a day. Uh, and and the, the that great a lot thing, of money. yes, uh, actually, well, really. the, and they, well, they had no place to spend it, so it accumulated. Right. And once they went back to Germany, they each of these men had money. Uh, that was given to them that, that they hadn't spent. So hundreds of thousands of men going back to Germany with anywhere from 50 to to $100 in their pocket really helped the German economy at yeah. the end of the war. So they're not just prisoners, but they're making money and, right. and we got what we needed to get done here. Yes, so. and uh, we also made money right. off of the program, which is really amazing. Um, the, uh, 
the um, unions complained that that 10 cents an hour was going to undercut normal civilian pay, which was anywhere from 40 cents even up to $1.10 an hour. Uh, so it was uh, decided that the, the employer, the civilian employees would pay the government, employers would pay the government the going rate. The government would pay the POWs the 10 cents and keep the difference. Wow. So the government made that $25 million. It more than paid to bring them in here. It more than paid to feed them, clothe them, and house them. In fact, there was money left over that actually went into the war effort. Um, so it, 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 the, the program was highly successful. And it was so successful, um, there were over 420,000 prisoners here. At the end of the war, only seven men were unaccounted for. Wow. Um, and we know of four men who, who escaped uh, success successfully. One man uh, wound up in Chicago, Illinois and owned a bookstore for 30 years. Another gentleman uh, uh, wound up uh, working in a, a tool and die factory in Cincinnati and turned himself in. And all four of these men turned themselves in in the 80s and uh, Ronald Reagan pardoned them. Is that right? Yeah. They had become functioning and, and, and American citizens and right. they all had families. This is their home now. And so. They, exactly. So they were pardoned and they were allowed to live here. That's awesome. That's a great story. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. My pleasure. And again, thank you for what you do. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. So were you actually part of the war and stuff like no, that? No, uh, I'm, I'm much too young. I'm a uh, Vietnam era. Okay. Uh, but I have uh, a little bit of background in history. Um, so I was hired because I had a commercial driver's license. And, um, uh, and then it turns out I have no family, no pets. I can be gone on the, on the road 10 months out of the year. I was in speech and debate. I had no problem speaking in front of crowds or being interviewed. Right. So I just fit in perfectly what they were looking for. Great. That's awesome. And I've been doing this four years. Well, uh, normally we just travel. Uh, um, um, uh, fall and spring, we're not equipped for real cold or real hot. Um, but last year we were uh, uh, on a national tour. We were in the south, so we went through the winter. And this year uh, uh, we started uh, last week of August, and I'll go through uh, the middle of December. So where's your next stop after you head out of here? Do you have a schedule? That you're yes, on? yes. Uh, we're a tour, sch tour schedule, and again, you can visit our website, uh, uh, traces.org. Uh, click on traveling exhibits current. Uh, then uh, scroll down to bus three, click on that, um, and then when that comes up, click on national tour, and you'll see our entire schedule. Awesome. And from here, um, I'm in uh, uh, Ontario on uh, Thursday. On Friday, I'll be in um, in uh, uh, Marion. Saturday, I'll be in Naples, and then uh, uh, we're trying to get more places in New York State. And then I head to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and then South. Now, do you run the website, or is there somebody there else uh, that we the, can thank wait, that well, yes, for uh, having you? Uh, the office is in St. Paul, Minnesota, okay. uh, where the museum was. The recession hit us two years ago, right. so we closed our doors, and now all we do is set up the tours for the bus. Right. And well, I was glad uh, to, I mean, it's, it's awesome having you out here. Thank you. I and, it. I mean, I, I challenge everybody that's on YouTube and stuff, you know, that... That there aren't, you know, it's actually for all we do, we're non-profit too, you know, and stuff like that. But we try to help out as much as we can. So if you guys can help them out with any cash or stuff like that, when you see them, check them out, head them up when you know, so they can they can continue you. on stuff like this for all of us to be able to enjoy and stuff like that. No, we we appreciate you, you know, for what you do to take your time out and to be non-profit. I know how hard it is because what we do, we started out supporting motorsports. Three years ago, I mean, it all came out of my pocket to do what I started, and thank God Google Incorporation picked me up as a partner on YouTube to be able to um, get a couple extra bucks to do something like this, you know, to help out you like that and help out my friends around here. And there's a lot of people that are in the service and stuff that, you know, that will appreciate this video because I have a lot of people that are in the service right now that are in Afghanistan and they were in Iraq. And they're emailing me all the day. They love my videos and stuff like that. So to let these guys know, you know, that are serving our country right now, that you're here, and I'm here to support you, not less them there. Uh, this will, I think, it'll be a good outcome. So we appreciate you very Thank much. You, so I appreciate, I appreciate your doing. time today oh, and letting us uh, make this video. So, so thank you. You bet.